How should you structure the core of a domain-centric architecture such as the clean architecture? I'm going to split this video into two parts. First, I'm going to explain what the clean architecture is, and then I'm going to show you how to implement the domain and the application layers, which together represent the application core. Here's the visual representation of the clean architecture, and even though it's represented using concentric circles, it's still a layered architecture on the implementation side. At the core of the architecture, we have the domain layer, which you can see contains the domain entities and the most important business rules. One level above, we have the application layer in red, which contains the application use cases, and the use cases basically orchestrate the entities and tell them what to do. And then on the outskirts of the architecture, we have the presentation layer, which commonly contains your API endpoints, and then the infrastructure layer, which contains implementations for external services such as databases, identity providers, and HTTP clients. What I want to focus on in this video is the domain layer and the application layer, which are collectively called the application core, and these two layers, the domain and the application, should encapsulate the most important business rules of the system. I don't want to ramble on about these concepts for too long, so let's actually see how to implement the domain and the application layers and what do we place inside of each one. This project only contains the domain and the application layers for a run tracking system, and let's take a look at what's defined inside of the domain layer first. For example, we have a user class which represents an entity. An entity is a concept from domain-driven design which represents an object that is defined by its identity. If I take a look at the implementation of the entity class, you'll see that I have an ID property inside which defines the identity of my entity object. One more thing I have defined in my entity base class is the concept of domain events. Using domain events, you can represent significant facts in your system, which you want to allow other consumers to subscribe to and then handle them accordingly. The domain event interface is just a marker interface. And if I take a look at the implementation, for example, a user created domain event, you'll see that it only contains the user identifier. And this is enough to know which user was just created but the more important part is the actual name of the event, which carries the information about what kind of event this is, and we know that this is a domain event that is published when a new user is created in the system. You'll notice that the domain event and the entity types aren't actually inside of my domain layer. I define them in something that's called a shared kernel. This is another idea from domain-driven design allowing me to share common models between my bounded contexts. Right now, I have an entity and a domain event inside. I also have some guard clauses, such as guarding against a null or empty string. I also have the concept of an error, which I'm using together with a result object to implement the result pattern throughout my application. The result pattern is useful when you want to implement proper error handling, and I like to use the result pattern for errors that I know how to handle in my domain. For example, I'm documenting all the errors that are relevant for a user inside of the user errors class, and you can use this approach to document the possible errors in your domain. For example, I also have the email errors, such as when an email is empty, or when the email format is invalid, and this makes the possible domain errors explicit which is a very valuable property to have. Another thing I have defined in my shared kernel is the concept of a date time provider. This is useful if you want a single point of entry for your application for obtaining the current time. Now, if I go back to the user class, I mentioned that this is an entity, but if you take a look at the constructor, you'll notice that I'm accepting some other classes inside, such as the email and the name. What about these two? Are these also entities? Well, no. If I take a look at the email class, for example, or rather the email record, you'll notice that it's not implementing the entity base class, and it's actually a record, and this is because the email is a value object. A value object is another concept from domain-driven design, and it represents an object that is defined by its value. In this case, the email has just a single value, but value objects could also be complex, such as an address, which has a city, street, country, zip code, and so on. 
or it could be a money object which contains an amount and a currency, I hope you get the picture. Value objects are useful when you have some invariants that you want to encapsulate inside of these value objects and they help you solve primitive obsession, which allows me to use strong typing inside of my user entity and not have to reference primitive types for the user's properties. Another concept that is also part of the domain, although this is a debatable opinion, is the repository contracts. I like to define the repository interfaces in the domain layer and the implementation of these interfaces will live in some of the upper layers, most likely the infrastructure layer, but you could also have a separate persistence layer. The repository interfaces only work with domain entities and they don't return any kinds of DTOs. I handle that in the query handlers, which I'm going to show you when I'm covering the application layer. Other than the repository interfaces, you will also see something like a domain service. Here's an example of that. Domain services encapsulate business logic that doesn't naturally belong to any of your entities. And in this case, I have a domain service for implementing one user following another user in the system. This covers the most important aspects of the domain layer. So let's move one level up into the application layer. And you'll notice that this layer contains my application's use cases. So I have a use case called start following, which contains the start following command. So this command together with the respective command handler represents the implementation of my use case. And I'm using commands together with queries here because I'm implementing the CQRS pattern in my application layer. CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and it's an architectural pattern where you split your application's reads from your writes, both logically and sometimes even physically, to gain a lot of flexibility, separation of concerns, and the option to scale the writes and reads independently. Now, each command should encapsulate all of the information required to handle this use case. In this case, I have a user identifier and a followed user identifier, which are enough for me to implement the start following command handler. The command handler is responsible for taking in any external dependencies, such as the user repository, the follower service, and the unit of work, using the dependency injection approach, where we are taking in these dependencies through the constructor. And then in the handle method, you'll notice that we are just using the dependencies to obtain our domain entities, in this case, the user entity, and then delegating the business logic to the domain by calling a domain service. After getting back a result, we persist the changes to the database by calling the unit of work save changes method. So as I mentioned at the start of the video, the application's use cases are just orchestrators of the domain logic. Let's take a look at another example, like the create user command. You'll notice it contains the required information for creating a new user, and then the command handler implements the actual logic. And in this case, it comes down to performing some validations, checking if the email is unique or not, and then again, orchestrating the logic by calling the domain method. In this case, the user create factory method, and it's going to just insert the user to the repository and persist this in the database. If you're wondering how I'm implementing the commands and queries, these are just marker interfaces for the time being. Although in practice, I would most likely implement this using the mediator library because it's very straightforward to use. I would just have to implement mediator's iRequest interface and everything else would be plugged in automatically. I also have the concept of a query, which is a use case where I'm just fetching data from the database and returning it for a view or a file or something else. Let's take a look at some example queries like the get user by ID query. It only needs a user identifier to implement this query. And then in the implementation, I'm using EF core in this example, just a simple link query with a projection into a user response, which we are going to return from our query method. And I also have another query, which is the get user by email query. You'll notice that here I'm using Dapper to implement my query, but I'm also returning the user response, the same as in the EF core example. The important part is that I'm splitting my use cases into either reads or writes to the database, and the queries should be as straightforward as possible, just returning something from the database, while I'm making the command handlers more complex with the use of repositories and domain services 
because I want to delegate most of the business logic into my domain layer. And I'm also getting the ability to easily unit test my use cases because I can simply mock these interfaces using something like add substitute and write all the test cases that I need to verify that the behavior in the handle method is what I'm expecting it to be. So apart from my commands and queries, which implement my use cases and the messaging abstractions, I also have some abstractions for external services. So I've got an iApplication DB context, to be able to work with EF Core in my queries. I also have a unit of work interface, which allows me to persist my database transactions and an iDatabase connection factory, which allows me to create database connection instances so that I can write dapper queries. What's powerful about this is I can just create my abstractions in the application and the domain layer and start implementing my use cases right away. The use cases are perfectly testable and I can verify that my behavior is what I expect it to be. And then I can just write my implementations at a later point and verify that my integration is working correctly. If you enjoyed this quick overview of the domain and the application layer, take a look at this video here to see how I start modeling a domain from scratch. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons and until next time, stay awesome.